Welcome to the fourth episode of the Global Communications Podcast. With us today is Astrid Hoag, a di digital political consultant based in Denmark. In 2013, she founded the Astrid Hoag Bureau to help companies and organizations with strategic use of social media. She also lectures and comments on social media, politics, and digital transformation in the press. Astrid is the author of four books, most recently, Crisis, Gunpowder, and Hug. I love it. Today, we will explore the power of digital and political communications. Thank you so much for joining us today, Astrid. It's great to have you and great to see you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And you can pronounce your last name correctly since I have uh, butchered it in the intro. So, is, so can you pronounce it for us, please. Yeah, it's a Haug, Astrid Haug. Oh, hug. Okay, so with the Global Communications Podcast, one of the things we hope to do is just really open up the world to our audience. So we usually start with a context, geographic context, and you're based in Denmark. So can you tell me a bit about Denmark today? Yeah, so Denmark is a very small uh, country in Scandinavia. Uh, around 5 million people. Uh, I live in Copenhagen, which is the capital, and uh, it's a social democratic country. And right now we have the second female um, uh, prime minister in, in Denmark ever, and she's a social democrat. And uh, especially in an American context, we are usually portrayed as socialists, but we uh, tend to think of ourselves as social democrats, which means mostly that, you know, education is free, uh, universities is free, healthcare is free, uh, and so on. And of course, then we pay quite a lot of taxes. But actually, if you ask the Danes, they are more than happy to pay their taxes because they actually feel they get a lot from it. And especially in the latest months with uh, COVID-19, it has been very clear that healthcare is free for all in, in Denmark and uh, everybody is in, 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 in more or less terms uh, fairly equal. So we are one of the most uh, equal countries uh, in the world. Um, and of course, we usually uh, look very much to Sweden and Norway. The language is very common. The mentality is very common. And our biggest export market would be Germany. So in, let's dig a little bit into Europe as well. You just uh, mentioned it. So it's a nice segue. And Denmark's influence. Are other countries in Europe like Denmark? How is Denmark perceived in Europe? That's a good question. We are a small state, so there is a, a definitely a small state community within the EU, but we are also the, uh, among the more skeptic uh, EU countries. Uh, and uh, Great Britain, of course, was also one of the very uh, EU skeptic, and they are not part of that anymore. So the, the EU skeptic um, part of the EU has, uh, has declined. For example, we don't have the euro, we still have our own Danish crowns uh, and, and so on. Um, I'm, I'm very pro-European, but in the population overall, uh, there's, a, there's a divide, more or less 50-50. So you could say that the, the role of Denmark within the EU is not very big, but we do have Margrethe Vestager, uh, which is the, uh, the uh, yeah, I don't remember her exact title, but she's like the, the second in command within the EU uh, commissioner, uh, and she's been... Uh, become uh, world known for the cases against Google, Apple, and, and so on. And just to brag a bit, I actually used to work with her at the Danish parliament, uh, where I worked for, uh, for the Social Liberal Party, and she was, uh, she was the head of the party at that time, or, or became the head of the party. So I know her very well, and she's doing a good job in the EU right now. Great. Now, if you had a crystal ball, do you think Denmark will go the way of the UK in terms uh, of the EU? <clears throat> No, I don't think so. It's too complicated. And I think also EU has uh, done a great job of showing that uh, leaving EU is not something you just do from one day to another. Uh, so I don't think so. But uh, from time to time, there that, that definitely has been talks within uh, Danish parties, uh, particularly the more right wing parties uh, who would like a, a, a Dexit, we call it, a Danish. It's not within the, um, the, next, uh, the next years for sure. That's great. And I have to admit um, to the audience that Astrid and I know each other. We go way back. Uh, we were both volunteers on John Kerry's presidential campaign and it seemed like so long ago in such a different world ago in 2003, 2004, almost pre, pretty much pre-social media. It was used in universities. Yeah. I think Facebook was kicking off then. Uh, for those of you who don't know, John Kerry was uh, the senator from Massachusetts 
Democrat for many years, and then he became the Secretary of State, of State during the Obama administration. Um, and since that time, I've enjoyed watching you just flourish in your career, um, studying and analyzing digital communications with political campaigns, which is a super hot topic um, right now globally. So can you tell our audiences how you started on this path? Mm. So it actually did start back in 2004 uh, during the John Kerry campaign. Uh, you probably also remember the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth who actually made videos and distributed them online uh, against uh, John Kerry and, and for George Bush. Um, and we also saw back in those days, uh, Howard Dean, who was like kind of the Bernie Sanders of that time, uh, he had a lot of like young bloggers uh, in his community and his campaign. And they started rallying uh, online. It started with small contributions uh, online a bit later on and so on. And from there, it just exploded. Um, and, and then I went back from the States to, to Danish politics and I had uh, I tried to convince Danish politicians to you know, start blogs and, and use social media once it was uh, available too. And then in 2009, I wrote my uh, first book. I just uh, found it called Listen to the Elephants. And the elephants here are actually the people uh, who, are, who are like, you know, making a lot of noise on the internet. So back in 2009, uh, I said with this book, uh, listen, you've got to, as a, as a company or as a politician, you need to look into social media. How can you use it and how will, how will it affect uh, our world? Um, and then I've just been following that path uh, during political jobs, also working at the Danish newspaper as a community manager, and then for the last uh, seven years in my own company, where I help companies and politicians uh, use social media uh, for, for, for their benefits. That's wonderful. I want to get into some how politicians can use social media and communications, but first I'd like to see, you, you went through it a little bit, um, but what the trends you've seen in political communications over the past 15 years? Yeah, I actually wrote it down because the question was like the trends uh, over 15 years is a big question. So uh, I think I will highlight just uh, three things. And the first one, of course, is obvious. It has become more digital. That also mean, it means it has become faster. So it's 24 seven. The new cycle is like an hour, maybe two, and then we are on to something else. Uh, this also mean, means it has become more polarized. We don't have like one common conversation. Everybody is having their own conversations uh, online for, 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 yeah, for better or worse. Uh, so that's the first one. It has become digital. It, ha it has also become way more personal, uh, both in terms of uh, focus on the political person. We saw that with Obama, of course, but especially with Trump and how he's making politics personal every day on his Twitter. It's about attacking other people um, and defending himself. Um, so both for politician and I also see that in Europe, they have to show more of themselves. They have to be like kind of like a superstar of the days, uh, but also in terms of micro-targeting. So you as a voter has also become personalized. So when you sit in a political campaign, you try to target people in, in very small groups, as, as small as possible with various uh, methods. And we saw that in, in, in the Obama years, but also we've seen it very much with Trump. He's very good at making these uh, micro-targeting. We also see it in Europe, but because we have some more strict uh, data policies, it's a bit more complicated to make uh, an exact uh, copy of what uh, is going on in the States. Uh, and I think in some ways this is good, uh, but also here politician is trying to target um, people uh, as personal as possible uh, to, uh, with social media and social media has made this possible to do uh, also on a, on a fairly low budget. So that was the second one and the th third one is it's more like overall, but I think it's very clear in the last 15 years that the overall power in terms of uh, politics has shifted from mainstream media to uh, tech companies. And again, it might be self-evident, but if you think about it, it's not the New York Times who sets the agenda, agenda it's, it's Twitter and Facebook. And we saw that also with the, with the hearing in, in the US Congress just a few weeks ago, where the uh, big four tech CEOs, uh, they had to answer for, for what they have been up to and, and how they run their business. They are at the essence of uh, our democracy and our political conversation. It's not the mainstream media. And I don't think we have really grasp how do we how do we do that i mean what, what kind of society we do we then have if it's up to facebook and google to decide how do we have this conversation so i think that discussion will lead us into the next at least uh, 10 years as well can you go into micro targeting just a bit and explain why that's important 
It's important because you can, uh, so you, you, for example, let's just take the states. It's, uh, it's the country most people uh, know in, in more detail. So if you, for example, for the Democratic Party, you can say you have a lot of uh, different uh, voter groups you want to address. Some might be interested in uh, environment, some might be interested in uh, equality, and some might be interested in jobs and so on. So you, over time, you find out what do people actually uh, care for, and then you can target them with a specific message on that. And then if you have a budget of, let's just say, like 1 million uh, US dollars, you can put $10 or maybe $1,000 here and $1,000 there. And then you have like a, like a patchwork of, of different messages. Um, so the people who see this message, they might not see the other one. And then you can, can diversify it. Great. And so, and actually Trump, for example, he has run over thousands, uh, thousand different ads on, on Facebook, targeting different uh, voter demographics on different issues. Great. And then the tech companies, which is a really important issue. And you've seen, I think it's the past mm, four months or so, where they've been starting to tag his tweets in terms of content, um, yeah. particularly Twitter, and being more uh, proactive in that means, which, as you said, is giving tech companies more power on information and who sees what and where it goes. Um, do you see that trend? I, I had another in the third podcast with a journalist in Bangladesh. We touched on this a bit because there is more of a crackdown, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, happening with access to social media overall. We somewhat predicted that maybe some of these, as we saw from the testimony recently, that maybe some of these tech companies will be, I don't want to say going away, but will be reduced in their ability to influence over time over the next 10 years. That was our opinion. You have more knowledge in this area. What do you think will happen if you, again, another crystal ball, but what do you think could happen over the next 10 years? Wow. I think it's very optimistic to think that their power will decline. Uh, so one of the, the, the things that came out of the, the hearings as well was that um, especially the uh, the chair of the committee, he wanted to break up some of these uh, tech companies. It, it has also been something that especially Elizabeth Warren and other uh, especially Democrats have talked about, can we break them up? But even if you manage to break these company up, it will take a long time. It's not sure it will actually uh, go through and so on. Have you then solved the actual problem? So if you imagine Facebook being broken up into uh, Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram, you still have Facebook with an amount, uh, uh, amount of power. So I, I think we need something more, uh, actually more drastic uh, than just uh, that. So I, uh, looking in my crystal ball, I just see these tech companies having uh, even uh, more power in the future. But I do hope that politicians also will stand up for the power they actually have and start regulating and, and looking into these companies. And we have this discussion about what kind of democracies do we actually want to have? And do we think this is, uh, this is working? And, and at least from my perspective, I see more and more politicians, both in the States and, and here in Europe, uh, standing up and saying, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at the, at the, uh, in the current situation. So of course we need to, to solve that. But, but you do see it, uh, for example, in Europe has actually been, uh, been the first mover in that sense. Uh, we had the GDPR uh, regulation uh, a few years back, which is about data policies and actually giving the individual citizens uh, the right to own their own data. Uh, which is very uh, good and very important. And you have also seen how the EU, of course, has fined uh, very, uh, various of these uh, tech companies, uh, Google, Apple, and so on. Uh, that's not enough, but it's definitely a signal saying we will not just let them do whatever they want to. Which is incredibly important, I think, as we move into, we're in an election year in the States now and as other elections come up. So just to segue from there, what can political campaigns and candidates running for office do to really harness the power of social media and digital to get their message across? Um, if you can provide an example, maybe of one or two candidates in different countries, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. So of course you could take the obvious one, but I'm not going to do that. And you can also take one which, uh, which I don't think is, uh, who I don't think is doing so well. Joe Biden is, is not particularly digital. And that was also actually a, a problem, I think, for, for Hillary Clinton. She was not a natural digital candidate. But when I, when I saw the questions, I, a question I was, uh, the first one who came to my mind was actually the uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand, um, uh, Jacinda Ardern, I think, I hope I pronounced it right. Uh, and she, I mean, she's, she's active on social media, but basically, basically she's just doing a good job. 
So if you want to be a politician and you want to have a good conversation on social media and get a lot of bars and so on, I mean, do a good job first, first and foremost, right? Uh, she has done a great job in terms of uh, COVID-19 and various other cases. She doesn't use Twitter. Uh, I was just uh, looking at that, but she's very active on, on Facebook and, and Instagram and doing a lot of these Facebook lives where she's talking about where she's going to and what she's up to. So it's, it's kind of classic uh, social media, but she's doing a great job and, and she generates good storytelling around her person. So I think that's still essential uh, that you have a good story and that you actually uh, are doing a good job. But if I want to, if I should um, highlight another politician who's like a, a social media natural, uh, um, uh, that's uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And you have probably seen uh, the, the sound bites too and the small clips from, uh, from, um, from the Congress where, where she, uh, she's very good at questioning other politicians. And just recently she had this case where she walked up the stairs and uh, uh, Representative Joe Ho called her, uh, called her words like saying she was crazy and dangerous. Instead of just um, you know eating it up, as you would say uh, a few years ago to women, just eat it up and move on, she makes a point of it, and she makes a viral uh, hit actually out of her, her small speech uh, about this incident. So she's very good at like creating a movement. She's very good at like taking uh, like an everyday situation and and making it like a bigger purpose, and 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 saying this is not about me. This is about all women, and and making it. Uh, political uh, so she's very good at making these yeah everyday issues very political and she knows exactly how to do it so it will uh, go viral on social media so she's like watch and learn uh, AOC she's really good at this do you think older candidates are at a disadvantage say the over 50s in terms of digital I know it's a loaded question, but I think yeah, just yeah, yeah. Because in some ways they are. I must be yeah. honest. I mean, it, it, when I'm like consulting, I'm saying no, no, no. It's just a matter of attitude and so on. But but here in this uh, forum with you, I would say yes, they have a disadvantage. Just they're not they're not born with uh, an iPhone or a smartphone in their hand. Uh, they don't feel comfortable maybe being on Snapchat and TikTok or even Instagram. Um, but then from time to time, you see like older politicians too who are actually good at social media. Donald Trump is probably the best example that we all know of. Uh, you can discuss whether it's good or not good, but it's there, right? Uh, so he's a, he's a good example of that. Um, I think also the, the former prime minister in Denmark, he was, um, I'm not sure, was he around 50 or something? Now I might uh, uh, offend him, but, but he was like at least over 40 and well into his 40s. And he was also doing a lot of uh, social media very naturally and, and uh, especially Twitter. So it is a matter of attitude, but you can definitely see that the younger generations of politicians, they, they just do it uh, as an, as an add on. It's not something they have to sit down and, and think uh, carefully uh, about. Uh, so, so yeah, definitely we'll see new generations uh, pop up and that will be an advantage for, for younger candidates for sure. What would your advice be for an older candidate besides hiring Astrid to help you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great advice. Uh, no, I think, I mean, start social media early and, and build a movement. So find out what do you want to engage people around? So it's not just about, okay, how can you make people like me and see me and so on? It's more like, what kind of movement can I start? Uh, and I just came to think of in, in Denmark, there's a, uh, there's a new party called the Vegan Party. So it's, it's, the, it's a party just based on the vegan, uh, vegan agenda. So anti-meat, right? And uh, they just uh, gain enough signatures to, um, to, to be part of the next election. It's not sure they're going to you know, get any mandates, any seats in the parliament, but they, they have the, uh, the, the signatures to, do, to precede that. And, and they engage people around the vegan uh, agenda. And uh, for most politicians, it might be something else. But for AOC, of course, it's also this about like uh, female issues. It's about uh, young people. It's about not being privileged, but you know, having the right to 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 stand up and say what you what you uh, believe in, and so on. So you have to create this kind of uh, movement around you because that also means you have a lot of uh, spread it uh, for you. And then also, of course, use various formats, uh, live video, polls, uh, blogs, all these various formats uh, that you can think of um, is, is, uh, is still good. And, and last thing, also use uh, as many social media as you can. I mean, for some, especially if you like more an, an unknown candidate, 
there might be lesser competition on, on TikTok and Snapchat than maybe on, on Twitter and Facebook. So, so make sure to look at the whole social media landscape and say, okay, where would there be a, a space for me to, uh, to pop out? That's excellent advice. And I just want to go back and talk about your new book, Crisis, yep. Gunpowder, and Hug. I love the title. Can you tell me more why this book and why now? Yeah, so I have it here actually. So in Dan Danish, it would be Krise Kruder Kram. And uh, so it's about strategic communication. So I've written a lot of books about social media and the importance of social media. But um, I was looking for a framework to do strategic communication. So how do you bind social media and, and other forms of communication, press and so on together? So what I did for this book was to uh, talk to various uh, organizations and companies uh, about how they work with strategic uh, communications. And, and then I made this framework and that's the, the hot part of it in Dan Danish it's called Kram. So it's like uh, context, resources, agility and, uh, and measures or goals. I mean, so you can have this framework and from there you can, you can build your strategic communications. And just uh, one point from the book is that mostly when we do strategic communications, we have this plan and we set out to do exactly what's in this plan. But then we meet reality and then you see that a lot of new things are coming up. So I have this uh, model in the book also uh, from, a, from a, a guy called Minsberg, which says you have, to, you have to work more with the emerging things and actually take that into your strategy, whatever emerges. And that goes very well together with social media. So you put something out and then you watch and see, okay, what is, what is popping up? What is, uh, what is buzzing? And then you grab that and move on from there. So it's, it's my way of trying to, to, yeah, to create a new framework for strategic communication for companies and organizations. And that's an excellent point because a lot of companies, they have their plan. They try to stick completely to the plan when the outside scenario is changing all the time. And I think there's an internal fear of testing and trying. Right. So exactly. it's an excellent point. And, and you can also say, like I, I started the book a long time ago, I don't know, a year and a half, at least maybe two years ago. Uh, that's all, always how it goes with these books. But then it came out actually uh, during uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, in the spring. Uh, and I thought, oh, it's outdated. But then I came to think about it. No, it's like totally relevant because everybody had to throw their 2020 plan away mm -hmm. and actually take whatever emerges and also look at the context. What can we actually do here? What is appropriate? And, and are there some gains? Uh, we can go for because uh, it's a new situation. So yeah, it, it just became more obvious that we need to be a bit more agile in the way we work with strategic communication. That's fantastic. And is there a way, um, do you want to give your website address or a means for those, particularly in the English speaking world, there is Google Translate. So uh, if you'd like to give your website address so people can go and access your books as well. Yeah. It's called uh, my name, astralhauk.dk, uh, and I might, there might be an English section, but it's not, it's not totally updated. Otherwise, go to my LinkedIn profile and uh, maybe uh, yeah, reach out to me there. Um, and some of my books are in English. The new one isn't yet, but uh, I might do some of it in English, sure. That's wonderful. And anything else you'd like to add? Um, any pieces of advice you would give to anyone, particularly the audience who's, who's listening, who has been thinking about running for office at any level? Uh, what advice you would give to them today? Yeah, so, so I think, I mean, in the last, yeah, 10, 15 years, social media has, has changed politics a lot. And I think politic politicians, they need to change social media. So I actually think, and you saw that also with Elizabeth Warren, that having an agenda about social media and, and how we regulate that and how we, um, how, we, uh, yeah, how we model our democracy and the conversation we have. I think a lot of people are actually fed up with, with Donald Trump, to be honest, or fed up with the way people talk to each other on, on Facebook and so on. Uh, so if you could have that as, as part of your agenda, I think there is uh, definitely um, uh, some some uh, interesting uh, things to 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 go for there, but also use social media to listen and especially listen to the younger people because, as we've seen with with the uh, with the green agenda like the environment and, and climate and so on, the younger people are the first ones to uh, to grasp that and to talk about it. So make sure to listen in uh, and also places and just your own page. Maybe go I don't know to yeah Snapchat, TikTok, Reddit, all these places. And listen, what is the conversation about here? And, and maybe use that as inspiration for your campaign. That's wonderful. Astrid, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for having me.